Hello, my name is Dale Daniels, and I am the Executive Director of CHANGE, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education at Brookdale Community College. CHANGE and its partnering organizations are pleased to bring you The Big Read, a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. In The Big Read, we are engaging citizens, young and old, in the reading of one book, A Lesson Before Dying, by Ernest J. Gaines. We have selected this book because its themes resonate with the mission of change, social justice, education, and racism, and because it asks the question, how do we restore human dignity to one who has been dehumanized? The programs of The Big Read give us the opportunity to explore these questions and to examine our roles, relationships, and responsibilities to our fellow human beings. Thank you for joining us. Please enjoy the program. Hi, I'm Dale Daniels, Executive Director of the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education at Brookdale Community College, also known as CHANGE. CHANGE, Brookdale Community College, and our partnering organizations are pleased to engage the citizens of Monmouth County in The Big Read, a project of the National Endowment for the Arts. The book we have selected for The Big Read is A Lesson Before Dying by Ernest J. Gaines. Today, as part of the Big Read, we are pleased to bring to you Sister Helen Prejean, uh, author of Dead Man Walking and an activist and advocate for the abolition of the death penalty. Welcome, Sister Helen. Thank you. Good to be here. Sister Helen, there are probably members of our audience who are not familiar with you or with your book, Dead Man Walking. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became so invested in the death penalty issue? Sure. Uh, the, my journey was, uh, it came out of a faith dimension in my life of trying to follow the gospel of Jesus and awakening to the poor and the struggles of poor people, which led me into an inner city housing project. And from there, working there, being there with the people, I got an invitation to write a man on death row in Louisiana. And two years after beginning to write the letters and visiting him, he was killed in the electric chair. And I was there with him and telling him to look at my face. And it came out of that killing chamber that night. It was April the 5th, 1984. I think 87% of the people of Louisiana were all for the death penalty when that happened. And I had watched the protocol of death of the state right in front of my eyes. And uh, I vomited. I had never watched a human being be killed. Uh, and it was all legal. Uh, nobody protested. None of the religious leaders were speaking up. But I had seen it. And that's how the whole mission began, that I've been a witness, I've seen it close up, I gotta tell the story and bring the people there. So I began to give talks, and then I wrote the book. And then uh, out of the book, the movie Dead Man Walking was made by Tim Robbins, Susan Sarandon, Sean Penn. And then, but it's all about taking people close up to something because we're all sold on this, that this is what we have to do to keep our society safe. But nothing like the direct story, not only of the perpetrator on death row, but then of the victim's families too. Because part of the ultimate legitimization of the death penalty is we're gonna do this for the victim's family because they've had a loved one killed and justice demands that we kill the one who killed their loved one and we'll let them watch it and that's gonna heal them. And I assume you found that that didn't really heal them? How did, what was the process that went on? Well, it's like they get caught up in this. The DAs are the ones who want the death penalty, see? And it's very much driven by politics because it's such an easy symbol that the way you're gonna to be tough on crime is you're gonna select the worst criminals and we're gonna kill them and that's gonna deter others or whatever the reason is given. And uh, the victim's families really don't have much choice in this. They're traumatized, they've been through a loss. Often the DA will approach them and say, 
this is what we're going to do for you. And, um, and they get swept up in it, and they think, yeah, of course. And they get pressured to some extent in it, too, because some families go, well, I didn't particularly want the death penalty, but they're all telling me, well, this is what you got to do because you lost your son or whatever. And so getting to know them over the years, realize that uh, they, even if they, when they watched it, and when they came home after the execution, like the second story in Dead Man Walking is this Vernon Harvey and his wife Elizabeth who had lost their daughter. And they couldn't wait for the execution. And they're there. And they're afterwards, they turned to the media and they said, how do you feel now? You got to watch Robert Lee Willie die, the one who killed your daughter. How do you feel? And he said, uh, anybody got any whiskey? Anybody want to dance? We got him. We killed the SOB tonight, and I got to watch it. And then he added, you know what? He died too quick. I hope he burns in hell. And they kept showing up for every execution to say, another murderer getting his due justice for the victims. And they couldn't break out of it once they got into it publicly. And so what heals families? And this waiting for this so-called justice uh, is not really, they need comfort, they need solace, they need counseling, they need help. The siblings who have had their siblings murdered need help. That's real healing. So you obviously felt so moved that you wanted to bring the story to the public. Why did you choose a book as the first way um, to Well, get the first way actually was to begin to give talks to whoever would hear me. And, and then the writing of the book happened kind of organically out of that. Mm -hmm because you speak, then you write, and then these resources came forward and they just took me by the hand and brought me to Random House to a wonderful editor who helped me shape the story uh, because there's a way you could write that book. He said that nobody's gonna read it because they're gonna expect you as a Catholic knowing you're the spiritual advisor of this guy on death row and they're gonna think you can't really face the crime and the horror of it head on. It's going to be, well, he's a son of God, he should be forgiven, but to face it head on. He helped me shape the story in Dead Man Walking. He said, if you don't talk about the crime that they killed two teenage kids in cold blood in the first 10 pages of this book, nobody's going to read your book. And so then you take your reader with you. I wrote it in first person, present tense. As I go through the experiences and it all unfolds and it unfolds for the reader too. Then, then the story went on to become a movie, yeah. um, and then you mentioned an opera and even a play. How have these uh, new expressions of, of your writing you know, brought the story more forward? Yeah. Well, the opera, of course, brings you into the fullness of drama and music to educate the human heart. Mm -hmm. And music brings us to places in our hearts we don't even know we have, so it's a very powerful way. Of, of telling the story. The play of Dead Man Walking was written by Tim Robbins and turned over to the young people of the country to do. It's called the Dead Man Walking School Theater Project because he wanted to invest it in the young people before he gets it produced commercially. On Broadway, you give it over to the young people and so they do the play in their school, high schools and colleges, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they're discussing it in their classes. So they really dig into the issue and get close to it and get rid of all the myths. Oh, well, it costs too much for life without parole and all those things. They don't have real information. But also, finally, it's the imaginative thing of seeing that a person did a crime. They're guilty. I'm horrified at their crime. But now to look squarely in the eyes of what does it mean for the state to take them and kill them. Very powerful way to address it with young people, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as you know, um, this project is about A Lesson Before Dying, and that book is also set in Louisiana. Um, it also tells the story of a young man who's on death row. I, what are some of the points that resonate with, with your real experience? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the mama's whole thing is, I don't want my son to die like a pig. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I want him to know he's a human being and that, that dignity and the lesson before dying. 
And so Ernest Gaines beautifully takes you there and, and helps to see that this person has dignity. And the difference between the two is mine's real stories of real people, uh, including in my second book, The Death of Innocence, Dobie Gillis Williams, a black man with an IQ of 65 who was railroaded and killed. Mm. And in my book, it's to bring people to, not just to see that it's wrong, not just to have a heart of compassion, not just to see the dignity, but to resist the death and to work to end the system that's putting people in this crucible of death. So it's really about action, which is the really important piece. That well, people the, well that's what happens inside of us when our consciousness changes and our imagination, because the only way you can kill a person, that's why I'm really glad to be here at the Holocaust uh, Awareness, because how did the killing of Jews happen? You have to turn a switch. They're not human like the rest of us, and we have to dispose of them in order to be safe. So it's good to have the connection between these two issues by being here uh, doing this. Thank you. We're going to take a short break now. We'll be right back. I get to make people's dreams a reality and help them protect their most valuable assets. Every day, I get to give your dreams a chance. I got my start at Brookdale. I got my start at Brookdale. All of the action is closer than you think here at Brookdale Community College. Join us in the new Robert J. Collins Arena located on the south side of the Lincroft campus. The Collins Arena is a multi-purpose venue that is used for several campus and community events. Numerous layout options allow the arena to accommodate a variety of special events including live concerts, intense mixed martial arts and kickboxing tournaments, high-flying cheerleading competitions, the well-designed Jersey Shore Home Show, and the Shore Conference Basketball Tournament for all the sports fanatics looking for an unforgettable game day experience. Don't wait, grab your tickets today and join us in the Robert J. Collins Arena where every event is a special event. Learn more about our upcoming events today. Call us at 732-224-1867. For more information, find us at brookdalecc.edu slash events. to gun crimes. You'll always be your mother's baby. So before you commit a gun crime, think about who you'll leave behind. Gun crimes hit home. Welcome back. We're here with Sister Helen Prejean. Sister Helen, it's been almost 20 years since you began your work to uh, eliminate the death penalty. Has this had an impact on your religious perspective? Yeah, very much so. Uh, first of all, I even awakened to get involved with poor people and to work for justice and in coming to understand more about what the gospel of Jesus was really about and not just about living a polite, comfortable Christian life, being kind to people around me, but getting involved in the issues of the day where the suffering is. And, uh, and then as I went through the experiences of being with a person on death row and accompanying, I've accompanied six human beings to execution. And then I've also been with the victims' families in it. 
the understanding religiously of what Christianity is about has really flowered in me. That Jesus' words, all the spiritual traditions, that your neighbor is yourself, an extension of yourself, to love your enemies and to, and to forgive and not to you know, reproduce the harm they've done to you to try to cause more hurt, came alive and I saw it operative, see, and especially through the victim's family, like Lloyd LeBlanc, whose son was murdered. And uh, everybody was saying to him, he's in Louisiana, death penalty, everybody was supporting it, that, hey, Lloyd, you got to be for the death penalty or it'll look like you didn't love David. And he, tr and he had to really struggle because he, he said, well, they're right. I mean, this is what the law allows. This is justice. That's what he was told. And he said, yeah, I want to see him die. I want to see the ones who killed my son, caused us this suffering. I want to see them die, and I want to witness it. But he didn't like what happened when he went there, and he, he realized that the hatred and bitterness was taken over him. And then so he set his face to go down the road as a Christian, but Jesus had said forgive, to forgive those who had killed his son. And he said, well, a lot of people think that's weakness, like you're condoning what they did. They kill your son. How can you not want to see him die? And the, the way he came to it spiritually was to recognize, well, they killed my son, but I'm not going to let him kill me. And, then, and so he chose the path of forgiveness. Uh, so that came alive in me like, oh, this is what it means where Jesus said to love your enemy, uh, not to condone what the enemy does, and to be, you can be horrified at it. Uh, and then the other was, here's what the law said, that when somebody kills, the state can kill them. And I'm brought right inside the protocol of death and how the guards are involved in doing the killing for us. And I meet people, that I tell all these stories in Dead Man Walking, of the guard who got brought into the execution squad uh, who had been a supervisor on death row, and as long as he did that job. But then he had to be part of the strap-down team and the people doing the killing. And after five executions, he called me in his office, and he goes, Sister, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to quit this job because, he said, uh, I'm having nightmares. I come away from it. I know the man's defenseless, and we take him out and kill him, and there's something wrong in that. So I, I saw it close up of what it means to take a human being, render them defenseless, no matter how outraged we are over their crime, but that the death penalty is about us as a society, and then watch as the person's killed. And then another mother buries her child, and I saw the futility of it. And I also realized that the American people don't reflect deeply on this issue because it's not one of the moral issues that people think that affects most people personally. And so they just, it's kind of superficial. And so because I'd been a witness then, part of it was to go and bring the story to wake up people. And that was love for the American people, that we don't deserve to be doing this to each other and that there's goodness in people. And if you can wake them up, We'll change this. And so I've been working to end the death penalty. Resistance to evil is really important, not just to feel sad that bad things are happening, but then what am I going to do? How shall I work for justice? So mine has been, I stay on the road. I, I spent a lot of times at, at 35,000 feet going from city to city, universities, churches, synagogues, wake up the people. So you've created a, what you call a Catholic mobilizing network. Can you sp explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah, well, you see, it was a shock to me that when I awakened on this and watched what it meant to kill a human being, that our Catholic traditional teaching, like in most Christian churches, had arisen out of a time in the 12th century, 13th century, where the, the only way that you could protect a society because you didn't have a prison was to kill the violent people. And so the Catholic Church had upheld the death penalty for years, 1,600 years. 
And here I am face to face now with what it really means to reproduce the killing, imitate the violence, and kill the people. And so the dialogue began with my own church, with the people most of all, but then also with the hierarchy. And in the second book, The Death of Innocence, I talk about how I finally got to have a direct dialogue with Pope John Paul and, and questioned him. I said, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent life? Well, when I'm walking with a man to execution, he's guilty of a crime. He's guilty, but he's rendered defenseless, and he says, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs. Where's the dignity in this death? To render a person defenseless and take them out and kill them. And we need you to take a stronger stand. And so then Pope John Paul did do that, in fact. And so Catholic mobilizing is about getting the grassroots to get in there. You don't just have in any religion where you have the hierarchy make a statement, oh, now as Catholics, we're not for the death penalty anymore. You have to take people on that journey of the heart so that you can be converted inside yourself to see, oh, no, to be a person of compassion demands a human rights, human rights, that no one should be tortured, no one should be killed. And that's what Catholic Mobilizing Network does. So I would imagine after all these years that this has had a tremendous impact on you personally. Can you share some ways that it has impacted you? Well, you know what? Uh, one of the things is uh, I never go to meetings that are not about anything. I always concentrate on being parts of groups where you're working to make real change happen. And, uh, and by being so close to death, it's helped me to understand the dignity in all life, all people, even those among us who have done a terrible crime or worth more than that worst act of their life, to appreciate life and to live my life, to really live my life. And so to use it, to pour it out, to do what I've been awakened to do in responsibility uh, for the rest of, the, of my community, my society, that we're going to need, we need to put the death penalty behind us. Is there a specific message you'd like to share with the children of Monmouth County before you leave us today? No, absolutely. There's, you're never too young to start learning about human rights, the dignity of everybody, all people, no matter how different. Uh, you're never too young to start learning that. It starts on the playground, starts when somebody bullies somebody starts when people make fun of somebody who's different, for children to learn early on that everybody has a right to be respected and difference is not something to put down and to demean and make fun of. It's to celebrate and to learn to appreciate it. And when we do that, we become a stronger person ourselves. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sister Helen. For more information on Sister Helen, please go to her website, sisterhelen.org. For more information about change, please go to our website, change.org. Thank you for joining us today.